Hello and welcome to another presentation dealing with developments in the phonology of English during the early modern English period. In particular, I'm going to be talking here about changes and other developments related to the short vowels in early modern English. The short vowels don't get a lot of love in this period because the long vowels are really getting all the attention because the long vowels are known for the changes related to the great vowel shift. But as we'll see, there's some interesting things happening with short vowels as well. Our starting point then would be the short vowel system of Middle English. Middle English had these five short vowels arranged into traditional positions in vowel space. Uh, so focusing on the front vowels, short I in Middle English was an I, and short E in Middle English was an E. Um, neither of those changed in early modern English. So if it had an I in Middle English, you expect it to come out with an I in early modern English and actually in present day English as well. Same thing for E. If it was an E earlier, it's an E today. And actually, this is largely true um, all the way going back all the way to Old English. So Old English short I was an I, continued to be an I in Middle English, continued to be an I in early modern English, and is usually an I today. Short O in Middle English was typically pronounced as an open O, as an O, so frog and top and on in Middle English. In Early Modern English, this generally didn't change, so it remained an, an O, an open O sound. But later, um, and we get closer to present day English, these changed. So it, it lowered further in vowel space, so a, from an O to an a or an a ah sound there, right? So in, in British English, a, uh, you might get a word like uh, top. In American English, that would be unrounded to top. Both of those are uh, more recent developments, sometime in the last couple hundred years. Short u is a little bit more complicated. So short u was an u uh in Middle English. So you'd say mud and sun and push with an u uh vowel. In Middle English, most examples of words that had that U uh sound, the short U sound, come out as an U uh sound, right? So we say mud and sun with a mid-central vowel. That's represented by the, the wedge symbol. Um, but some of those short U words stayed at an U. Uh. So you have words like push and pull and bush and butcher, which kept the uh, there, right? We don't say butcher, we say butcher. Um, and so there, there's actually a phonological conditioning that you can see these words begin with a labial and there's certain consonants that come after them. Details aren't important. The point is that some of them be, uh, kept the uh sound, which is why we have that sound today, whereas the majority of them became an uh sound, as in mud and sun. Short a has a kind of interesting history. Um, the vowel that we call short a in Old English was an a ah sound, and then in Middle English that a ah became an a ah sound. So the Mi Old English word hat becomes in Middle English to be pronounced hot. And then in Early Modern English it's like it changed its mind and it went back to an a ah sound. So Middle English hot becomes Early Modern English hat. But um, there are some later developments which led to a little bit more complication here. So when that short A appeared before an R consonant, it was typically backed, meaning it came to be pronounced not as an A, ah, but as an A. Ah. So uh, you see this in words like hard and park and harm, which have an A, ah, a back vowel. In the early part of early modern English, those would have been haired and perk and harm with an A. Ah vowel, which I think you'll agree is pretty cool. Also, the vowel short A was backed when it appeared after a W, a w sound, so wadder and wash and swan, as they would be pronounced in the first part of early modern English, eventually come to be water and wash and swan with a back vowel. And finally, uh, that short A was backed and also lengthened a little bit. Uh, when it appeared before voiceless fricatives and before some nasal consonants. So staff and class and path and dance come to be pronounced 
staff and class and path and dance. And as you can probably tell from my pronunciation, that's not the normal American way of saying those words. That is the sort of standard British English way. So this is actually, this particular part of the change is one that happened not to all dialects of English, but only some of them. And we'll talk a little bit more later on this semester about when that happened and what varieties of English were affected by that. Just one other sort of uh, related thing having to do with vowels in uh, early modern English for you, a little bonus. Um, phenomenon that we might call smoothing of diphthong. So you know what a diphthong is. A diphthong is a complex vowel sound where the tongue starts in one place and sort of glides across the articulation of that. So a vowel like ow uh, is a diphthong because it involves sort of two different vowels smushed together. Um, smoothing is a kind of old-fashioned term for turn, turning diphthongs into monophthongs, uh, monophthongs rather. So simplif simplifying them from a complex vowel sound to a simple vowel sound. So in this example here, Middle English, ow diphthong comes in early modern English to be pronounced as an aw, right? So the word cause in Middle English would have been cows, uh, and then it comes to be aw cause here, hauk goes to hawk, and autumn becomes autumn, right? Similar sort of thing with the Middle English diphthong, au, open o plus an u, that goes to a simple o sound. So uh, Middle English canau or blau goes to no or blow, and saul becomes sol with an o sound. And then finally, Middle English diphthong a, a plus i, as in day or raz or eight, goes to a simple a sound, de, res, eight. Of course, later on, the o and a in words like no and day, uh, those are diphthong guys. So uh, the way we normally say them in most varieties of American English today, we say no with a diphthong o, and we say day with a diphthong a. But that's a later um, development where they become diphthong guys. The reason I uh, mention this uh, is to sort of highlight uh, an, another point about English um, spelling, actually. You'll notice that in all of these words which derive from Middle English diphthongs, the way the vowel is represented is through a kind of combination of letters, right? So in a word like cause, the a vowel is represented with two vowel letters, a-u. Um, in, even in hawk, the a-w kind of represents um, that fact that this word comes from a diphthong, right? In a word like raise, the AI sort of shows you that it comes from a diphthong because it involves two vowel letters to spell it. And this is just part of a general uh, theme that we often see when we think about the relationship between spelling and pronunciation. The way we spell words today is very often um, a better representation of how they were pronounced in Middle English than how they are pronounced today. So we see the representation of the origins of words in terms of the Middle English spellings in the way that we spell things today. This is um, kind of a pain for learning to spell today, um, but it is a real plus when we're thinking about the history of words and where they come from um, today. So you thought that your whole life that you were struggling with English spelling, and finally, it pays off for you because the way that we spell things gives you clues about how they were pronounced in Middle English. I'll see you next time.